In this video, I'll teach you the core of the Kotlin programming language. Kotlin is a general purpose, statically typed language that has become extremely popular in the last few years. Kotlin can be used on both the client and the server, which means the code can be run either on the user's device, the client, or on some computer in the cloud called the server, which responds to requests from the client. On the client, Kotlin is now widely used for Android development to write apps for the 2.5 billion devices running the Android operating system. Kotlin has seen a huge rise in popularity, and I can promise you it will only become more popular in the years to come. Kotlin is an example of a programming language, which is a way for me and you to communicate with computers. At the end of the day, computers only understand binary zeros and ones. So over the years, we've created many different ways to instruct the computer what we'd like it to do. Each of these approaches is called a programming language, and you've probably heard of some of them, such as C, or Java or JavaScript. Since Kotlin was created much more recently, it has taken the lessons from the earlier languages to make something that is both powerful and easy to use. Java and Kotlin have a special relationship since they're compatible with each other. Kotlin is what Java would look like if it was designed today. To write Kotlin code, I'm going to be using a program called IntelliJ, which you can download for free from the internet. To start out with, I created an empty file called Kotlin Minutes. The file extension for Kotlin files is .kt, and the code we write will be inside this special function called main. We'll talk more about functions later. In classic fashion, the first thing we'll do is print out hello world. So we'll use this function called println and type in hello world in double quotes. Now we'll execute our code by hitting this green arrow, which will compile and run our code. Compiling just means taking the symbols and keywords you write and turning that into something that the computer can actually execute. You can see the output in this run tool window that pops up where it says hello world, as we expect. Let's start our tour of Kotlin with variables. A variable is a piece of data which has a name and a type. For example, strings are a sequence of characters. So my first name would be stored as a, as a string type. The way we'll declare the variable is with a special keyword called val. You can tell it's a keyword since it'll turn a different color in the editor. In Kotlin, every variable must have a type. That's why we say Kotlin is statically typed. So in this example, the name of the variable is first name and the type is string. Because we're setting the value of the variable equal to draw hold right away, we actually don't need to specify that this is of type string. This is a nice feature of Kotlin called type inference, where if it's obvious what the type is, we don't need to explicitly indicate it. There's also an important concept of whether a variable is read-only or readable and writable. If the value of a variable can change after it's initialized, then we have to declare it with this var keyword. Since my weight goes up every holiday season because of how many cookies I'm eating, We'll use var for that, but my first name will never change. So that'll be a val. There are a few other built-in types in Kotlin, in addition to string and integer, which we just saw. For example, double is for decimals, like 2.5, and booleans only have two values, either true or false. As you write more code, it's sometimes helpful to leave yourself a note about why you wrote the code in a certain way. These are called comments, and you can leave a comment by using a double slash. Commented lines are ignored by the computer. Now that we've talked about variables, let's look at operators, which allow us to manipulate these variables. For example, we can combine two strings into a longer string with a plus sign, which is called concatenation. Here, we're printing out the value of s1 plus s2 in this variable called combined. So when we run the program, we get the result of call me maybe, which is a concatenation of call me and maybe. This is an example of a binary operator because it takes in two inputs. There are several different binary operators for numbers, as you might expect. With two integers here having value nine and four, we can add them together and get 13. We can also subtract them, multiply them, divide them, or find the remainder after the division with this percent sign. That would be one in this case. Let's talk a bit more about strings. Strings are a sequence of characters, and there are a bunch of useful things you can do with them. For example, retrieving a character in the series by indexing into the string like this. In Kotlin, like most other programming languages, we start counting at zero. So the first character, k, will be at position 0, and the second character, o, will be at position 1. In the output, we can see the first two letters of Kotlin. We can also check if a string is empty using the method isEmpty, which returns a boolean true or false value, or we can get the length of a string, which is an integer, by using the dot .length property. If we run this, we can see that my string, Kotlin, is not empty because it has characters, and there are six characters, which is why the length is 6. Another method is substring, which will extract a portion of the string between the start and end index that we provide. So substring with parameters 2 and 4 will output tl, because we will start at t 
which is index two, include index three, the L, and then go up to, but not include index four, the I. One really handy tip as you start writing more Kotlin is to explore other methods available to you by hitting the dot or period after writing the name of your variable. You'll get an autocomplete dialog which shows you all the possible things you can do with this variable. The period is probably one of the most important symbols in Kotlin since it allows us to use the built-in functionality of the language. One thing worth pointing out is that the options and methods that you get will depend on the type of the variable. For example, the options here with the integer will be different than what we had with the string. One last point on the topic of strings, we'll frequently want to print out the value of a variable inside a string. For that, we'll use the dollar sign to do string interpolation. The dollar sign means that we'll replace the variable here with the contents of it inside the string. So if you run this, we can see the output is the string is Kotlin because the value of my string is Kotlin. We can use interpolation for variables of any type. Let's move on to conditionals, which are a way to execute certain code depending on a condition. An if statement is an example of flow control, which will evaluate whether a statement is true or false and execute some code only if it's true. For example, we can print out a message if this exam score variable is greater than 70. Because the value 88 is larger than 70, when we run the code, we see you passed because we're running the code inside the if block. The statement we're evaluating here can be anything with a true or false return value. So for example, we could do exam score greater than 70, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to, equal to, or not equal to a value. I'll change this back to exam score greater than 70, but what if we want to do something if that condition fails? For that, we'll use an else block, and the code inside of here will get run if the condition fails. In this case, that means that the exam score is less than 70, so we'll print out you failed, and now let's change the exam score to 55, which is something that will trigger the else block to run. And so here in the output, you can see the message you failed. We often want to hold a bunch of variables at once instead of defining them one at a time. For that, we can use collections. For example, instead of having a separate variable here for each of my friends' names, we can have one variable, which is a list of strings containing all my friends' names. So now if I wanted to print out the third element in this list, we could do that by looking at index two of our names list. Remember that Kotlin is zero indexed. So Ali is at index zero, Maya index one, and Chen at index two. When we run this, we do indeed see Chen in the output. By default, collections in Kotlin are immutable, which means we can't add or remove elements from the list. If we want to change the contents, we must declare the list as a mutable list. By changing the declaration, now we are able to add a fourth element. All elements in a collection must have the same type. So in this example, everything is of type string. And we could actually make that explicit by adding this string type parameter to the declaration. If we tried adding something else into the list, we would get a compile error. For example, here we're trying to add 80, which is an integer into the list. And if I hover over it, it says the integer literal does not conform to the expected type string. It's really common to do something on every element in a collection. The most common way of doing that is with a for loop. For example, if we wanted to print out each element in our list of friends' names, we'd write the for loop like this, for name in names, print lin name. If we run this, we can see the output is the three names in the list. The way I think about this is that in every cycle or iteration of the for loop, the variable name will take on one element of the list. and It'll go in order. So first it'll be Ali, then Maya, and then Chen. The other common use of for loops is to do something a certain number of times. We can use for i in one dot dot five to execute something exactly five times. So if you run this, we can see that the operation that we're doing five times is println, and we're printing out i each time, where i will take on each of the values one through five before it exits the for loop. If we don't want to include the last number, then we can do for i in one until five, and that will just print out the numbers one through four. Next, we'll talk about functions. Functions are a way to combine chunks of your code so we can reuse them throughout our program. This makes our code easier to read and think about. We can create a function with the fun keyword followed by the function name, so in this example it's my function, followed by open and close parentheses, and then the body of the function goes inside of these curly braces. Now we can invoke our function from the main function just by calling it with the open and close parentheses. If we run this, the body of my function gets executed, so we print out hello. If we want to give this function some input, we can add the parameter name and type to the function signature. So here we have a parameter name of name and the type of string. In the body of the function, we can treat the parameter as a normal variable. So here 
we're including that input into the print line. You'll notice back in the main function that we now have an error when trying to call my function. And that's because whoever invokes this function is responsible for passing in the correct number and type of parameters. Let's pass in the string j for the parameter. And if we run this, now we can see hello j as the output. We can also set the visibility of functions to be private, so they can't be accessed from other classes or files. People always ask me, what kind of private fun are you having? But that's the topic for another video. Finally, the concept of null is really important in Kotlin. Null means having no value. And if a variable is allowed to have no value, then we need to update the type to include a question mark. This means that the variable Instagram bio is a nullable string. So on Instagram, if you've written a bio, then this variable would have a string value, but if it's not set, it would be null. The important thing to remember is that we can't call any methods on something which is null. One way to get around this is to check if the variable is not null. And then in the body of this if statement, we can now safely call any method we want. In this case, because we're setting Instagram bio to null, we'll fail the check on line three, which means when we run the program, we get an empty output. However, if we update Instagram bio to be a string, then we will get into the body of the if statement, and that's how we're printing out uppercase growth. The other way of doing this is to use a shorthand for exactly this if check, which is the question mark dot operator. So we can say Instagram bio question mark dot to uppercase. And this means we'll only call this method on this variable or this object if it's non-null. So if we print this out, we can see that we now get growth in uppercase printed out twice. That's pretty much the core of Kotlin. We went over variables, operators, strings, if statements, for loops, and functions. If you're interested in learning more about all the good stuff in Kotlin, I'd love if you hit the subscribe button and like this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.